And of course we need to apply this appreciative mode to people. If we're very honest, drastically honest, and it's difficult to be even a little bit honest, and it's extremely difficult to be drastically honest. If we're really, truly honest, we'd have to admit that we use people. I hope I'm not just projecting my own uh, state onto you all. Um, we use people. We use people. Even our near and dear ones, perhaps especially our near and dear ones, we use them. Use them for comfort, support, pleasure. Use them to get on in life, to get somewhere. If we're very honest, if we have a good look, we might well discover that probably all our close relationships are contractual. There's a kind of unconscious contract, a kind of mutual using going on. We get something from each other. So, to that extent, to the extent that that's there, the relationship is not one of growth and freedom. We can often kid ourselves that our relationships are, of course, pure. You know, no, no, I love her or I love him. It's not for myself, you know, it's for her. You know, especially if we're overwhelmed with, you know, being in love. You know, it really does feel completely selfless. I know, because I've been there. Um, and um, so... Yes, we can sort of kill ourselves. But if, if, if we come down to it, that we have to acknowledge, well, actually, we're using. We love them. We're friendly to them. For the, not for themselves, uh, but for ourselves, from what we get from it. The big test, of course, the big challenge, is when we or the other person changes in such a way that we can't use them in the way that we've been unconsciously using them anymore. We can't get what we want. We don't get what we want. It's taken away. And our love, our so-called love and friendliness, turns very quickly well, to grief, confusion, pain, hate, jealousy and all that. I don't want to... I hope I'm not sounding too drastic. I'm just trying to get us to kind of look at what goes on. This using of people pervades probably all our relationships, including those that we say are in the Sangha with us our so-called spiritual friendships. Um, sometimes the using of others, you using them, they using you, is so extreme, you have to get away from that relationship um, because you just can't see each other as you are. So there's no growth, no freedom within that framework. But more often than not, it's really a matter of transformation, of changing perception. Changing perception, leading to changed behaviour, behavior, leading in turn to a transformation of perception again. And the practice here, of course, is metta. The development of loving kindness, beginning with simple friendliness and maitri. Uh, cultivating, moving towards cultivating uh, a non-self-interested friendliness. Loving kindness True metta, true loving kindness is really an attempt to see others as they are in themselves. So the metta bhavna practice is not about pumping up a feeling of feeling good about people. You can sort of use people in your metta bhavna. Oh yeah, I love them. That makes me feel so good about myself because I love everybody. Um, what you're really trying to do in the metta bhavna is to Look and see with a gentle warmth. Yes, it might become very intense and deep as time goes on, but at the beginning, you just look and see with gentle warmth the person as they are in themselves. Whoever arises in the meditation, yourself, your friend, the neutral person, the enemy. You're, you're looking uh, deeper uh, and depths, greater depths will uh, arise. You sort of let them emerge more fully into your friendly awareness. That's what you're doing in the Metta Bhavna practice. Seeing them more and more deeply as they are in themselves, independent of what you can get from them. And this brings up the whole 
wonderful Mahayana teaching of the levels of, 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 of friendliness, the levels of Maitri, the levels of Metta. They say, well, first of all, of course, you, you, you begin with, with people. It's, it's loving kindness for people. You have to see people as they are in themselves. You have to see, well, that, they, that as they are in themselves begins with seeing them, well, they're like you insofar as they want to avoid pain and they want to feel happiness. So, you know, because they want that, you wish them happiness. You wish them well. So you start on, on that level. But then, of course, as you look more deeply, you see that that person is a changing person. Um, well, they're impermanent. They, 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 they grow. They age. They go through all sorts of states and moods. They're not a fixed person at all. They're a flow of states, a flow of dharmas, which doesn't mean seeing them, um, you know, almost sort of scientifically, but it's more that you see them, they're changing. They're a changing being. So when you see them, you're, it's a deeper seeing of them as they are, and your love becomes more effective. Your love becomes deeper. But then they say there's an even further level, which is love for shunyata, love which is emptiness if you like it's not that there's nothing but it's more that you realize actually other people are utterly inconceivable you can't find the words to say what another is they just stand there in their uniqueness in their beauty and you cannot find words for that you see glimpses of this in, in what came to my mind when I was writing this was thinking about this was a painting um, that's in the Courtauld Gallery in London. It's of a painting by Cezanne, quite a famous man, of a, an old man with a pipe. A man with a pipe, he's got this hat and pipe stuck into his mouth. He's just a very ordinary old man from Cezanne's town, I guess. Uh, I think he's also in his famous painting of the card players. He's just an ordinary bloke and uh, you know probably nobody particularly you know cultured or developed but just a, an old man but when you look at that painting you realize it's a painting painted with meta um, and painted with real seeing into seeing beyond notions of that person and and this old man <laughs> kind of arises if you like as the expression of the inconceivable nature of life of living beings, of people. Um, this is what you're aiming for in the Metta Bhavna practice. For everyone, in the end. So friendliness, friendship, uh, is incredibly important for cleansing the doors of perception. And of course, when Metta flows freely between people, where there's no co coercion, no demand, no using, well, that's a very wonderful thing. And that's when you really have Sangha. And this is a very important value, an ideal for us in the order. It's something we really prize and live for and indeed fall away from and fail in, as we know. Uh, but also we do experience. I've certainly experienced this uh, mutuality of uh, loving kindness where I, I, I'm not feeling used and I'm not using others. Uh, where there's this very free, free-flowing loving kindness. So... Metta Bhavna, the practice of friendship, friendliness, Sangha, in the true sense, is a way of cleansing the doors of perception. Um, reminds me of a wonderful uh, passage from a great Christian writer, uh, English Christian writer named Alred of Rivo, where he has a wonderful passage where he describes sitting with his community in his monastery in Rivo Abbey in the north of England and uh, and, and realising that his spirit and the spirit of all those fellow monks just flowed into one another. They were just transparent to one another. He said he realised that there was no one he didn't love and no one that didn't love him. So it formed a, a wonderful, beautiful garland 